It's that unfortunate time of year for most teams. They didn't make the playoffs. Their off seasons may involve some tough decisions to make. Coaches to hire, players to keep, players to trade or cut. That's why we're not paid the big bucks for this. With the Super Bowl coming up, it may be a better time, but they can at least watch the game. And you can too, thanks to Fubo TV, the sponsor of today's video. Cost cutting is going to be a big priority for a lot of teams and probably is for you as well. Millions are moving away from cable to the greener pastures of cheaper alternatives. With Fubo TV boasting all the quality of cable at half the cost, it's a no-brainer. It offers over a hundred channels for your viewing pleasure. And this includes an impressive sports package. All of your favorite local channels, all major sports networks, NFL Red Zone. Games viewable in the glories of 4K? You can do that with Fubo TV. In fact, if you somehow can't watch the game, you can record it for future viewing. You can do it for any game in their sports arsenal. What could make this even better? By getting 15% off your first month of service. Get your free trial started by going to fubotv.com slash utree. You can painlessly set it up in two minutes, and if you're not satisfied, you can cancel at any time. It's a perfect chance to start with Fubo TV for yourself. Perhaps these 18 teams can jump on the offer as well. The unfortunate recipients of a dud. The Dolphins are one of the few teams in history to miss the playoffs after a strong 10-win season. Yes, they overachieved greatly throughout the season. Yes, it still sucks despite the surprise surge. However, there should be absolutely no reason to be pissed. This season was a huge boon for the rebuild. To watch this team grow in terms of structure, in terms of coaching, in terms of performance? If I'm a Dolphins fan, I'm ecstatic about this team's future. They've answered every question about them so far and then some. Ryan Flores looks to be an outstanding hire. They have a clear vision of what they want to be. But even then, there is a lingering question. Tua, what do you do with him? My belief is that you should stay the course with him since he's only a goddamn rookie, but the NFL is extremely cutthroat. If a quarterback isn't cutting it, teams aren't hesitant to throw them overboard. They have a lot of choices to choose from this offseason, and I'm very intrigued to see how they play this. Perhaps the best move comes from Chan Gailey resigning. Either way, the football world will be watching with interest. They're... gone. The Batman is finally gone. It's been so long I don't know how to feel. I had grown accustomed to their hardened boots smashing my face in. But now, I feel free. The Patriots are simply mediocre. They've lost a ton of talent. Stephon Gilmore might be gone as well in the offseason. It's wonderful. The only thing I wish is that Cam Newton was still good, but his shoulder is fucked. He's done. It's a damn shame since he still has the athleticism, but he looks like he's laboring every time he throws the ball. New England has some huge questions to answer. Player development has become an issue over the past few years. The core is aging, and every hot take specialist is saying that Belichick was merely the product of Brady. It's foolish to believe that, but they've made a ton of missteps over the past few years. Regardless, I think they'll be hunting for a new QB this offseason, and a wide receiver that isn't underwhelming. Thank the good gods above that I'll never have to see these bastards ever ago. Motherfuck! The New York Jets. Every single armchair analyst is telling them we told you so. This year wasn't even a butt fumble, that's too kind to the things we've witnessed. When you're on Adam Gase's wild ride, it only goes lower and lower. The first few weeks were an abomination of football, so the answer was to just say fuck it and tank. The disastrous free agent class of 2019 has become even more disastrous. CJ Mosley has only played one half of a game and Le'Veon Bell was cut when he couldn't be traded. Anyone that could be shipped off was, all the way down to the drywall. Sam Darnold has regressed to a toddler. He has been fucking ruined by Gase. And nobody knows if he's going to start for the team next season. Someone please save him. Joe Flacco's arm puns can't, neither can Frank Gore defying time itself to rot on a terrible team. Even then, there cannot be any joy for the Jets. Dreams of Trevor Lawrence with the number one pick flooded their minds, and when all seemed well, they completely fucked that up too. To add diarrhea to the shit Sunday, Woody Johnson is coming back from playing an apt ambassador. Keep him away from team operations at all costs, especially with our new coach in Robert Sala. I love what he did in San Francisco. And the dude looks like he can motivate a snail to run like Usain fucking Bolt. They once again have a lot of cap space going into the offseason. For the love of God, don't fuck this up again. Lil Jets doesn't have the tradition to keep it going. Even after years of personnel mismanagement, the Bungles have still learned nothing. They refuse to do even the slightest of changes to protect their premium assets. And the world witnessed such incompetence firsthand. Seeing Joe Burrow drop down like a sack of bricks was painful. 
We all knew their offensive line was going to get him killed. It was coming from a mile away, yet Cincinnati did next to nothing to fix it. Bobby Hart and Michael Jordan blocking defenders is proof of it. Now I get that DJ Reader and Trey Waynes were injured for most of the year, and Burrow looked really good when he played. But this should have been the impetus for change. Zach Taylor is completely outmatched in underseason as a head coach, yet he's still going to be around. Because apparently Mike Brown thinks he's doing a good job. Watching AJ Green not give a fuck is good. Watching Carlos Dunlap run himself out of town is good. What the hell are you watching, Mike? It's not that they haven't recovered from the wildcard loss to the Steelers in five years, they haven't even acknowledged it! <laughs> Jack Easterby still here. Honest to God question, no pun intended. This team is a fucking shitty. December 27th, 2020. The day that will forever live in infamy along the shores of the St. John's River. The Jacksonville Jaguars, for the first time in franchise history, secured the first overall pick of the upcoming NFL Draft after a 41-17 shellacking at the hands of Mitchell Trubisky and the Chicago Bears. Failure personified. A cold reminder that the suffering of the many in Duval County was preordained long before the week one season opener. The vicious cycle of irrelevance churned into motion with the off-season fire sale that would see virtually all of the top talent that wore the black and teal be exiled to different parts of the NFL world. Was this the plan to move forward? Was this the plan to build a contender? Well, ladies and gentlemen, maybe it was. Enter Urban Meyer. While hiring Meyer appears at first glance to be a slam dunk, there are plenty of risks to go along with it. While he had plenty of success winning 85% of his games at the collegiate level, Urban Meyer has approximately zero NFL experience. This brings another question that must be asked. How will his health hold up? How long will he be able to handle the stresses that come with this job in the NFL? As for their general manager position, the Jaguars appear to be taking a step backwards with their hiring of Trent Balk as their new GM. This was the man who took over as the GM in San Francisco from 2012 to 2016 and single-handedly tore down that franchise brick by brick. This is alarming. Yet even with those red flags that may be blaring for the general public to see, the sentiment in Duval is one of hope and excitement on a level that hasn't been seen since our last viewing of Saxonville in 2017. The state of the 2021 Jacksonville Jaguars is yet to be defined, but with the most cap space and free money available, there could be a league-wide rush of free agents to cash in on an opportunity to get overpaid to go play for the Jaguars. Whether or not that is something that's going to lead the franchise towards victory and achievement is yet to be seen, but there's no question that a new era in Duval County has begun, and it is one that is rife with potential and possibilities. The Broncos are probably one of the biggest disappointments in the NFL season. I expected this team to be a dark horse. They only went dark. To be fair, they were ravaged by injuries. Von Miller being knocked out before the season was only an appetizer of what was to come. The rest was just an orgasm of torn ligaments and broken bones. We thought Drew Locke was going to take a step towards becoming a legitimate quarterback this season. The only steps he took were for that stupid fucking dance he did after touchdowns. The rest were reckless decisions he made with the ball. The Broncos' most memorable moments? It was when they started Kendall Hinton due to every single quarterback being out of a game. At least that dude tried. 
Denver is in a strange spot. They have a lot of questions at the positions where they need definitive answers. If I can say anything, at least John Elway managed to promote himself away from day-to-day -day football ops. George Payton may be good, but a six-year contract out of the gate? Something tells me this is going to be a long-term project. Vic Fangio is staying put, but immediately gets placed upon the hot seat of Elway's wrath. You better hope it was just injuries that held this team back. It's as bold of a gamble as a dude saying they go 11-5 after they started the year 3-4. This team beat the Chiefs. Let that sink in for a moment. How the hell does a team that can hang with one of the best in football just fail at everything else? I'll tell you why. It's because that's what Vegas strives for every season. Things were looking strong early on. Derek Card returned to 2016 form, the offense was buzzing, Nelson Aguilar was making premium Philadelphian salt. The team was 6-3, delusions of playoff contention were running wild in Raider Nation. With this optimism, the fan base is rewarded with another massive collapse. Are you fucking serious? How could an entire defensive group be so terrible year in and year out? Big plays? What are those besides things they give up every game? That's why you lose five of six and fire the defensive coordinator, but I find something really disturbing. The Raiders have invested that much draft capital and free agent dollars to fixing the defense, and they're still having massive issues. It's time to point the finger at Groot. He's only brought about crippling mediocrity, and nothing shows signs of it changing barring a structural overhaul on that side of the ball. I just don't know if he can do it. Now with how he's been showing how the game has passed him by there. Pain. Nothing but pain. It is life. It is a labor of love. And for the Chargers, it is inevitable. The ways this team lost once again defy reality. Blown final plays resulting in agonizing losses. Blown double-digit leads on the regular as if it was going to church every Sunday. A dude who unironically calls himself the Money Badger missing kicks with regularity. Injuries ravaging the defense, including key contributors. And it was all complemented by some of the worst clock management I have seen in a long time. Running the ball just after you complete a Hail Mary with 20 seconds left. Only the Chargers could accomplish this. It's another lost season, but it's not all terrible, not at all. They have found their quarterback. Or should I say, another quarterback. Justin Herbert defied every single expectation to become the great savior this team hasn't had since Phillip Rivers. They even hired one of the up-and-coming defensive minds in Brandon Staley from the Rams. Did you see how well that defense played? Things are starting to look a little greener. But then somehow the Chargers will fuck this all up because it's been written in the stars for decades. Pain. The only constant here. Cowboys fans are going to argue with me that the only reason Dallas missed the playoffs this year was because of Dak's injury. That's a cop-out and you know it. This team's issues go well beyond no Dak Prescott. Even with a downgrade in Andy Dalton, the division was bad enough that they could have won it easily. But where the Cowboys really failed was everywhere else. The offensive line was ravaged by injuries and retirements. The team defense was on pace to give up the most points since the merger in the middle of the year. Zeke needs therapy for bulimia since all he does is throw up the ball these days. Jerry Jones kept his head in the sand instead of acknowledge his team wasn't any good. That's not even the worst part, no, that goes to Mike McCarthy. I don't think that leaked discontent after week six was an aberration. Look at the shit he was pulling this season. McCarthy has learned nothing from his time in Green Bay. Nothing! And they're locked into this marriage for a good bit to come. Are you hoping on Dak's return masking every other issue on the team? Knowing Jerry, this answer is probably yes. How about them Cowboys indeed? I want to hear absolutely nothing about how the Giants got screwed by the Eagles in Week 17. A six-win team deserves to be nowhere near January football. And it's insulting that people think they should have been there. You want to make the playoffs? Make this catch. This is your daily reminder that Evan Engram was a pro bowler this season. Also, Dave Gettleman is still here. The crusher of Giants fans' dreams has gotten an extra life due to some progress that was made. The G-Men have made great strides on team defense throughout the year. The front seven looks solid, especially by the end. The offense, not so much. Saquon had another year ruined by injuries, and who knows if he ever gets back to his old form. Receiving weapons only give drops. As for Daniel Jones, at least he's better than Haskins, but I don't think he's the long-term answer. He strikes me as more of a Fitzpatrick type instead of a franchise quarterback. And you don't draft that with a sixth overall pick. At this point, all they can hope is that Jason Garrett can clap up productive schemes next season. They'll need to if they want to get back to the playoffs. Welcome back to the exercise in agony. 
We all thought that winning that Super Bowl was going to be the first of many great runs for an up-and-coming team. But Philly always finds a way to fool us all. This statement can also be said about Carson Wentz. Once upon a time, he was considered to be one of the best quarterbacks in football. Now he is broken. Completely broken. Like so broken that you can't take him to the shop because they'll say he's been total mechanic shot, pocket presence shot, decision making shot, confidence shot. They're locked into a massive extension with him and the only way to get his pass form back is with an exorcism. Same goes for Doug Peterson. I have a hunch that this guy wasn't the reason why the Eagles won it all in 2018. The dude is the Dunning-Kruger effect personified. All of those terrible two-point conversion attempts, the baffling personnel decisions, the shit he pulled against Washington in week 17? There was no way you could have kept that guy in the locker room. Philly agreed. He was told to fuck off and take that statue of his with him. Good riddance. His replacement? Well, Frank Reich was really good for us here, so let's bring in one of his underseason disciples. Howie Roseman will keep breathing down his neck. And somehow he is still employed. If you're not scared yet, Philly, this is far from the end. I have over 50 million more reasons for you to curl up into a ball. The season was for the best, Detroit. You were never winning anything by imitating the Patriots. And we all knew it. Every time we had to see that useless blowhard Matt Patricia remind us that Malcolm Butler made a great play in the Super Bowl was one too many. Bringing in a bunch of New England's old defensive players didn't work. Stubbornly keeping in man coverage that only helps betters cover the spread against you never worked, especially with mounting injuries. It was a team run by hacks that ran around like chickens with their heads cut off. Yes, Quinn and Patricia are gone, but the team is staring at yet another rebuild. It's going to be led by a doomsday prepper that will bite people's kneecaps off. This is either going to be the greatest hire of all time or the next Freddy Kitchens. This change is going to be done at a great cost. Matthew Stafford has demanded a trade. He will be off to the greener pastures of hopefully a far more relevant franchise. Kenny Galladay is most likely gone too. Don't feel too bad, Lions fans. At least they aren't retiring in their prime. I think we thought this team had upside a few years ago. Like all of us on Cousins, we misjudged this team's potential. It's not because they suck, they have some incredible weapons. Dalvin Cook is a treat to watch every week, and Justin Jefferson? He had the best rookie campaign of any Viking since a guy named Moss. So what was the problem here? Defense. Mainly in a combination of injuries and player departures. Anthony Barr and Michael Pierce were out for the season by October. By the time Eric Kendricks got injured, they had just given up. The secondary play was some of the worst in football. Who knew losing Trey Waynes to free agency could do that? A common excuse will be to blame this bad season on Kirk Cousins and call it a day. Yes, Cousins is a problem, but he's far from THE problem. Try fixing that offensive line first. In fact, you know what the real issue is? It's Mike Zimmer. The game has passed him by and he can't adapt to the modern offense. It's fucking depressing to see. And I honestly expected him to get the boot to one employment. Oh, wait a minute. The Vikings extended him and Spielman before the season. Ownership doesn't want to eat those contracts. Oops. Don't worry, Minnesota, you'll be back in the same damn position next year because that's what this team is apparently comfortable with. It is the first year, but it's still a pain to watch and speculate. The Panthers punched above their weight to start the year. Things looked promising, but then the cold reality of a rebuilding team smacked them upside with a crowbar. 
they would lose painfully in many of their games, ending the season dropping 9 of 11. Even then, it does come with some caveats. The strong majority of their losses were only by one score, and they were without Christian McCaffrey for many games. It's simply a year that you can toss into the shredder since you can't gauge a rebuild in its infancy. I'm interested to see how this plays out. They showed flashes of having something strong forming, and Matt Rule had the team dialed in in most games they played. The question now is with Teddy Bridgewater. He leaves a lot to be desired, and rumors are swirling that he's going to be out of the starter's role next year. Personal advice, unless you can get something better, use him as a stopgap. You aren't ready for the big time just yet. Baby steps, Panthers. We'll get back there soon enough. This team makes you want to punch a wall or nine every time you watch them. They have all the reliability of a sports car made of paper mache. It flies for about a mile and then, whoops, broken down, time to take it back to the shop. The sheer inconsistency that this team shows from game to game, how drive to drive is infuriating to witness. The lack of discipline in key situations had them attracting penalties in huge numbers. Zane Gonzalez choked up in the clutch so often that you'd think he was a junker. Their inability to keep Isaiah Simmons in a stable role is only less disturbing by the utter uselessness of the offense without Kyler Murray. How much is this guy masking Kingsbury's flaws? Considering Week 17, it might be a good bit. The Cardinals are falling into the same traps that Cliff landed in at Texas Tech, being unable to fully utilize the talent on teams and imploding to finish seasons. They went from leading the fucking NFC West at 6-3 to dropping 5-7, of seven. and the only reason they won that sixth game was due to a miracle play. It's what I was fearing the Kingsbury era would look like. There's time to fix it, but it might have to be done without fits. From how he's talking, this might truly be it. This guy was still their second best receiver last year. That's fucking disturbing. Clock's ticking, Cliff. This is literally the same shit that happened to them back in 2018. The team was so injured to hell and back that they couldn't do anything. They were done by week five. That's how bad things got for them. Do you not believe me? Hear the list of wounded. Starting quarterback. Backup quarterback. Top two running backs. Most of their receiving core. Starting tight end. Starting center, most active defensive linemen, three top cornerbacks, both starting safeties, their MRI truck, the team plane, and their home stadium. Now tell me if there's any team in organized sport that can survive with all of that bullshit being thrown at them. It's why I'm giving them a pass for this disappointing year. Although it's the second time in three years that everything's been wrecked by the injury list, so some questions still might need to be asked, particularly about their training staff. Maybe if they're lucky, Santa Clara County will allow contact sports to restart by August. Shotgun. Murray, out of the pocket. Seven seconds. Six seconds. Murray, heaves it downfield! 